Amen. What uh, an incredible time of worship through song. And now we're going to enter into a time of worship through the preaching of the word. And this is something that is a tremendous honor and privilege for me to be able to preach the word of God to you. And um, before I say anything else, I think we need to be clear just so we're on the same page. Because I have a belief and I have a conviction that when we open up the word of God together... And if, by the power of the Spirit, if I rightly interpret and apply this word, then it is as if God Himself is speaking to us. And when God speaks, it um, demands a response from us, and it demands obedience from us. Would you agree? And so tonight, as we open up the Word of God... Um, Together, I take this very seriously, and if you will to, if you will give yourself to this time, um, this time together, and trust God that He is going to speak through His Word, this can and will be a life-changing weekend for you. Are you in? I can't see it. Come on. Are you in? Yeah. So you know me a little bit. I, I told you some earlier. I grew up in uh, Ulaga, Oklahoma, a real small town, and. Um, uh, Will Rogers is actually born there. Did you know that? It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't grow up going to church, interestingly enough. I didn't grow up going to church. Uh, my parents weren't Christians. They still aren't. Um, but uh, I had a friend when I was in eighth grade that invited me to go to church. And uh, I, I began to hear the gospel preached. And God saved me when I was in youth ministry. And I've been following Jesus ever since. And, um, and, and, and been pursuing him. Um, and uh, my parents got divorced when I was young. My, uh, my childhood was like, great, could have, could have been better, could have been worse, but um, God has, has brought me through it all. And uh, like you know, I went to OU, and um, I, uh, I met a guy who is the best middle school pastor on the planet, Mr. Kevin Cho, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. And... Uh, and, and Abe, a fantastic high school pastor, I just met him not long ago, but he's way better than I am. So um, you, you, you guys have an incredible staff, an incredible team uh, that uh, has been praying for you, and, and I have as well. Um, but I went to OU, and uh, I met Kevin, and, and uh, that's how I, I got connected um, here. But I also met a girl named Emily Claire. We dated off to college, got married, and then uh, we moved to Houston. And I've been a student pastor at a church called Champion Forest uh, for the past five years. And uh, like I said earlier, we just had a baby about five and a half months ago as well. Uh, so we're, we're having a lot of fun, and, and God is good. And I'm excited about this weekend and all that God is going to do. And uh, I want to challenge you and ask you up front, first thing tonight, I'm going to ask you a question. The question is this, what is holding you back? What is holding you back? And, and, I'm, and I'm asking you, what is holding you back from living your life completely for the glory of God? What's holding you back from living your life completely for the glory of God? And, and later, um, when, when we wrap up this time, we are going to challenge you to then leave that thing behind. Okay? And as we start, uh, a definition of, of the glory of God might help us. Um, one commentator defines it this way. God's glory is the revelation okay, or the revealing. Okay, revelation is when something is, is made known. So God's glory is the revelation and manifestation. Okay, these are big words, but to, to manifest something, it, it means to appear. So God's glory is the revelation and manifestation of who he is. His essence, his power, his majesty, his purity, and holiness. So God's glory is, is when everything that makes him him is, is revealed. That is God's glory. John Piper said that um, God's glory is when his holiness goes public. Okay, when we, um, meaning everything that sets God apart, everything that makes God beautiful, what makes God God, that is his glory. And when we get a glimpse of this, when we, um, when we taste and, and see the goodness of God, we're tasting and seeing a, a bit of His glory. And 
Um, when we get a glimpse of it, when we see the glory of God, um, it, it changes us and it makes us want to live our lives completely for the glory of God. And we want to, as followers of Jesus, if, if you're a Christian in the room, we want to live our lives in, in ways that show God to the world for who He truly is okay, and what He has done for us in Jesus. If you, if you have experienced the glory of God through what He has done in Christ, then as a response, we want to live our lives in such a way that promotes okay, and, and, uh, and, and props up and makes big what God has done, what makes God God, His glory. We want to live for it and we want other people to see our lives and, and see the glory of God lifted up. That's what it means for us to live for the glory of God. And when we get a glimpse of God's glory, when we see how good and powerful and loving our God is, when we taste and see, it causes us to give our lives completely to Him. But the reality is, we all know that we all have moments in our lives when we are not reflecting God's glory in our lives. Don't you agree? This is called sin, right? Any, any moment, any time, any action, any thoughts that we have that are not, um, that are not honoring to God and, and propping God up for who He is. This is called sin, and we all have these moments. We all have moments and times in our lives when we are not living for the glory of God. That we're not communicating by the way that we live that, that um, God has saved us and that we're living for Him. Don't we? Don't we all have those moments? I do. Um, and, and I want to ask you again tonight, what is holding you back from living completely for the glory of God? What is it? What is it in your life? What's holding you back from bringing God praise in everything you do? Because um, the, the glory of God, what He's done for us in Christ, it affects every area of our lives. Right? We can't compartmentalize different, different areas. Um, um, when we have been changed by what God has done for us, it then informs every area of our life. So what's holding you back from bringing God praise in every area of your life? There's no more important thing, as we'll see tonight. There's nothing more important than to live our lives for the glory of God. And our text tonight, as it was um, read, is Ephesians 1, verses 11 through 14. And here's the, the point of the sermon, and here's what I want you to see in the text with me. So um, each time that we do this, we get together, I'm going to give you a, a, just a, a, a sentence that kind of sums up the whole sermon. And I want you to see it with me in the text, because ultimately, like I said earlier, if what I say is not what is in Scripture, then, then you could ignore it. But if... You think that if you agree with me and believe that what I'm saying comes from the Scripture, then it is um, binding to us, and, and we must then respond to it, okay? So what we're going to see in the text, what I want you to see, and, and we're going to put this on the screen as well, is this. Our salvation is for the praise of God's glory, and our lives should reflect it, okay? Sort of, sort of a lot going on there, but our salvation is for the praise of God's glory, and then our lives should reflect it. Okay? That's the point. That's what I want us to see from Ephesians 1, verses 11 through 14. Let's um, look at it again together. If you, if you have a Bible, you can follow along with me, uh, but we also have it on the screen. Verse 11 says this, In Him, that's Jesus, in Him we have obtained an inheritance. Having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee or the down payment of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Don't miss this last phrase. To the praise of His glory. Remember our question. What is holding you back? What do you need to leave behind tonight? 
What we're going to look at is what this text teaches us about our salvation. And the first thing that we see is that our salvation is in Him. If you see, look back at verse 11. In Him. This Him is Jesus. And it is only in Him or in Jesus that we can be saved. Um, the, this whole section, if we would look at the rest of, of chapter 1 of Ephesians, it's the Apostle Paul telling the Ephesian Christians all of the blessings that they have in Christ. Everything that is theirs because they have faith in Jesus. There's a tremendous amount of, of blessing that comes. Some of those things, he says, in Christ is every spiritual blessing. He says, um, he chose us in him. He says, in him we have redemption through his blood. Right? All these things are, are above in that passage. And it is only in Jesus that we can be saved and experience all of the benefits of salvation that are talked about here in Ephesians 1. And there is nowhere else and no other name by which we can be saved. It is only in Him. It is only through Jesus that we can be saved. And to be in Him means that we have trusted in Him. That we've put our faith in Him to save us. And when we do that, then um, we are in a union with Christ. That's what it means to be in Him. There's a, a, a union that has happened there now. That now we receive all of the blessings of being in Christ. We're unified with Him. Okay? And this message that we can only be saved through Jesus, we can only have a right relationship with God through Jesus, is... Um, is something that our, our culture is increasingly pushing back against. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but at my church um, down in Houston, when, when I talk to my students, um, they tell me in, in more ways than one that it's not really uh, popular to be a Christian in school anymore. Do you agree with that? Like, does it get you anything to be a Christian? Like, does it earn you any popularity? Do people think you're cool because you follow Jesus? Does that happen here? Yeah, maybe a little bit. See, the, our, our culture is, is moving to where it's, it's really not um, as beneficial. And, and the message that you must be saved only through Jesus is increasingly um, difficult to hold. Yet, this is the truth that we continue um, to believe and to proclaim. And this is a beautiful truth. Um, that Paul says elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 1.18 that the word of the cross... That is the um, kind of what Jesus has done on the cross. The word of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So what Jesus has done to, to save sinners, to people who don't believe it, it's foolishness. It's silly. But to those of us who embrace it and believe it, it is a powerful message. One that I, I hope you believe this is a powerful message that our salvation is only in Him. We are saved only through believing what the Bible teaches us about what Jesus has done through His life, death, and resurrection, summarized by the message of the cross. I'm asking, do you, do you believe this? Do you believe this message about what Jesus has done? Do you have faith in Jesus to save you? We also see... Um, the rest of verse 11, that we also, in Jesus, in Him, we have obtained an inheritance. And we won't go deeply in, into this reality, but um, the truth is that we have a glorious uh, and a um, beautiful inheritance that is ours in Christ, that we will experience um, in its fullness um, in, in the life to come. For all of eternity, we will experience a, a, a huge, um, weighty, glorious, beautiful inheritance that is ours in Jesus in the life to come. That's what this promise is. And we experience it some now, uh, but, but more to be had um, later. And next we see that our salvation, the rest of verse 11, is predestined by a sovereign God. It says, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. So this is sort of uh, some, you know, theological language or some big words in there. Predestined um, according to the purpose of Him who uh, works all things according to the counsel of His will. Um, we, we can't miss this, though, because this is a tremendous source of comfort for the believer in Jesus. The, the reality of what Paul is saying here is that salvation, 
for, for those who believe in Jesus, has been planned from all eternity past. Okay? It was determined and, and planned beforehand. And this is a, it's what I'm going to call a mind-blowing concept and also a pride-blowing concept. Okay? It's mind-blowing. Have you ever just sat and thought about eternity? You ever thought about eternity? Like, um, like the fact that God has no beginning and no end. Okay, don't think about it. I see some of your brains starting to explode. It's a mind-blowing concept, right? When we, when we dwell on eternity, right? That, that God has no beginning and no end. He has simply always been, right? He is eternal. That is a, a mind-blowing experience to think about. And then um, this reality, then, is also a pride-killing Right? We, we shouldn't, um, there, there's no way that we can boast or be, be proud of, of anything, like any accomplishment that we could ever have before God. Because God has eternally planned to save a people through Jesus. Not because of anything they did, but because of his love and for his glory. Right? This is the, the end of any pride that we might have. When we start to feel like puffed up, uh, you know, like I've been, you know, I, I read my Bible, you know, two weeks in a row every day. You know, we, we start to, you know, I, I haven't missed, I haven't missed church in months. Uh, you know, we, we start to stack up all these amazing things that, that we could do and you should do all those things. Um, but they have ultimately, they, they don't stand uh, if we're trying to earn our salvation from God. No matter, we, we cannot earn our salvation from God. What, what Paul's teaching us here is that our salvation was planned from eternity past. So we can't even wrap our minds around. Not because of anything we did, but because of the goodness of God. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still enemies of God, undeserving of life, um, much less forgiveness and grace, God still chose us and He still extended forgiveness and grace. Salvation is God's doing. He does it. And this is good news. Right? God does not uh, make His plans willy-nilly. You know? He's not just, he's not just kind of doing whatever. It, it, there, there's no purpose behind it. You know, sometimes we just do stuff because we feel like it, we, you know, it's on a whim, whatever, I'm going to go do this. It, that, that, is, that is not how God is. I think of it like this. It's good for us in our lives to have, um, do you have any, like, people that you can talk to, like, good friends that you're going to talk to about before you make decisions? You know what I'm saying? Uh, like, you, you've got people in your life, maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your pastors, maybe some other friends that you love and, and look up to. Like before you make a big decision, you're going to talk to them, right? That's called having a counselor, right? If you get counsel from somebody else before you make a decision, uh, that's a good thing. It's good for us to, to talk and, and to, before we, you know, you have a guidance counselor that's going to help you choose what college you go to, etc. All those are good things, right? That's good for us. But... Um, God, what this is teaching us here, God, on the other hand, does not have or need any counselors. He doesn't, um, he, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't do things based off of what other people like suggest to him. You see what I'm saying? God works all things according to the counsel, the counsel of his will. He doesn't, he, he doesn't take into account what other people are feeling, what other, or what other people think. Right, other people's opinions. Um, nobody can sway him or change his mind on what he is doing. Which means nobody can change his mind about who you are in Christ. Do you see? If God works all things according to the counsel of his will, and he is, if you are in Christ and he has chosen you from eternity past... To be in Christ, then there is nothing that is going to change God's mind about you. Isn't that good news? Because um, don't we sometimes, whenever we are screwing up, 
Whenever we're in sin, whenever we're um, not living our lives for the glory of God, do you ever feel like, oh, I've, I've done it now? Right? There's no way that um, God could ever love me anymore. Uh, I, I've, I've messed it up far beyond repair. And what this truth is teaching us is that nobody, nobody, no thing, no person can change God's mind about you and about the love that He has set on you through His Son, Jesus. There's nothing that can change His mind. There's nobody, there's nobody talking to Him saying, Really? Her? Are you sure? Are you sure about her? I saw what, I saw what she did the other night. Like, really? Him? Like, that guy? Are you sure about him? And unequivocally, God says, yes. She is mine. He is mine. Nobody is going to change his mind. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. God did not make a mistake with you. God did not make a mistake with you. I talk with a lot of, of my students over and over and over again how they feel like nobody loves them. Uh, they're lonely. Right? We're more connected than ever through our, our phones and social media, but we're lonelier than ever. We don't have any true, genuine connection. Uh, they feel like they're a, a mistake, like nobody loves them. But if we grasp this truth, right, that we've been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, if we, if we would believe this, then we could rest and have confidence in knowing that God has chosen us to be His in spite of all the ways we've screwed up. This truth is yours to hold on to if you are a believer in Jesus tonight. You have been chosen to be His. And He's not, um, God is not taken aback or surprised tonight if you are here um, doubting your faith. God is not taken aback or surprised if you came to this weekend a little like unsure uh, about whether you even wanted to do it or not. God is not taken aback or surprised if you are here tonight walking in the midst of, of some really dark stuff. God is not taken aback or surprised if you have gone back into that sin that you continue to go back to over and over and over again. He's not surprised. Because nobody can change his mind about you. He doesn't want you to stay that way just while you're here. He wants you to to come out of it. He wants you to leave that thing behind and live for His glory because living for His glory is better for us. It's always going to be for our joy. There might be things in your life tonight that you need to leave behind and tonight is the night to do that. So again, remember our question. What is holding you back from living your life completely for the glory of God? What's holding you back? Now we get to the purpose statement of salvation in verse 12, and we also see it in verse 13. That our salvation is for the praise of His glory. Paul has two groups in mind. Okay. There's two groups there. Um, the first that we see, what, what does he say? That we who are the first to hope in Christ, do you see that in verse 12? And then he also says in verse 13 that also, uh, you also... When you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in it. Okay? All of this then, remember, is to the praise of His glory. So we have um, that the people who are the first to hope in Christ are to the praise of His glory. And then, oh yeah, everybody else, all you others who have trusted and believed in the gospel, that's to the praise of His glory as well. Do you see? If you are a, a, a believer in Jesus, if God has saved you from your sin, if you've repented and, and believed in Christ then the, per the whole purpose of, of your salvation is to uh, bring praise to the glory of God. That's what Paul's saying, isn't it? We see that the point of our salvation is for the praise of God's glory. It's what our lives are all about. 
Our lives are, are meant to um, prop up and, and put up what God has done for us in Christ. To reflect what God has done and, and reflect who He is to the world. To live for His glory. Remember we said earlier that God's glory is the revelation and manifestation of who He is. What makes God God. Everything about Him. His essence. His power. His majesty. His holiness. His goodness. All of those things are His glory. It's who He is. And we're to take those things and, and to prop them up in our lives. Our lives should reflect this truth, right? Because we all do things with a purpose, don't we? Think about this. Um, you uh, work hard in school so that, what? So you get good grades, right? You work hard in school so that you get good grades. Um, you practice your sport so that you'll get playing time, whatever. You um, eat so that you so that you won't get hungry, right? You see how there's always purpose behind the things that we do. Um, you watch Netflix so that any answers? I, I can't. I haven't been able to figure it out. I mean, I do. I do it too. I mean, I, I don't know. It's a, a, a lot of time wasted on on Netflix for some purpose. But you see what I'm saying? There's a there's a purpose behind the things that we do. We, we operate this way. There's, there's a purpose statement. Um, and God does things for a purpose as well. And that's what this is saying. Anytime you see so that in Scripture, there's a, there's a purpose behind it. And um, we see then that the purpose of God saving a people is so that we would praise Him. And that His glory would be shown through His people. And if there is anything in your life then, that does not promote and reflect the praise of God for who He is and what He has done, if there's anything in your life that does not reflect or promote what God has done and who He is, it's time to turn away from those things and, and pursue Jesus and the glory of God that's found there. The last thing we see about our salvation is that it is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Sealed by the Holy Spirit. You see that in verse 13. It says, when he's talking to the uh, Ephesian Christians, he says, When you heard the word of the truth, which is the gospel of your salvation, when you heard the gospel and believed in him, that's Jesus, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So all of these things happen simultaneously, don't they? We hear the gospel. The gospel being what God has done to save sinners through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we believe in that message. And when we believe in it, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We are sealed by God. He has put our mark on us. Right? We don't really have um, letter sealers anymore. But like in the old days, you know, they would have those wax seals. Uh, you would dip the wax in and put it on the back of a letter that would hold the letter closed. It was a mark. There was a seal there that was uh, that showed what it was like, who it was from. Right? There was a, a significant mark there. So there's something on us, and in this case, in us, that shows who we are. And when we trust Jesus to save us because of what He has done through His life, death, and resurrection, we are then indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The very presence of God now dwells in the life of believers as a guarantee or a down payment, right? Um, it's like, it's, it's like um, God, when, when we trusted in, in Jesus, it's like God gave us um, just a, a little bit uh, of, of um, a taste of what we're going to experience later. Okay, he says, I'm going to give you my presence, my indwelling presence now, as just a, a foretaste of what it's going to be like in, of, in my full presence and in the next life, when there's no more sin. So uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit now is a seal or a, a down payment um, through what Jesus has done. And all the praise goes to God for what he has done. We have God's presence within us to point us back to Jesus, to convict us of sin, to, to help us understand the scriptures. These are all things that the Holy Spirit does. God's very presence within us. 
All the praise goes to God for this and for what he has done. Our, our salvation is for the praise of God's glory, and our lives should reflect it. One famous preacher said this, When we get to heaven, it will be glory to God forever and ever and ever. We shall not hum even a single note to ourselves for our own glory or on account of any part of the work for which we deserve credit. But we shall ascribe the whole of our salvation to infinite love and undeserved favor and to the unceasing faithfulness and power of our gracious and promise-keeping God. It is all God's doing. <coughs> the way we live our lives should, should um, be the way that God is praised. Is that true of your life? Um, it is the way that you live your life causing God's glory to be praised. Like, do people look at you and, and, they, um, and they praise God for who He is because of the way you live your life? Is that true of you? That this, is the, this is the call for us. And if you are a believer in Jesus tonight, you have been chosen by an all-powerful Creator God to be His. Not because of anything you could ever do, but because of His love for the purpose of your life reflecting God's glory and causing His name to be praised. And if you're not a believer in Jesus tonight, you can be. And this can be your story. You know John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He sent His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you would believe this, if you would believe this message, that God created a perfect world, but sadly men and women turned their back on God. And they rebelled against a perfect God, and we all have. But God, having always had a plan, sent His Son, Jesus, to live the life of obedience that we all fail to live. And gave His life so that sinners could be saved and have a right relationship with God restored. And experience eternal life and abundant life now. If you would believe that message, that's what we just heard was the, the word of truth or the gospel of your salvation. If you would believe that, then what we've talked about tonight is true of you. And I pray that some of you believe this truth tonight. And for the rest of us, who are followers of Jesus, who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who God has chosen from eternity past to be His, so that our lives would reflect the praise of His glory, what do you need to leave behind tonight so that your life would reflect the praise of what God has done in saving you? What do you need to leave behind? Let me pray for you.